Yes. So in this talk, I'm going to consider a definite a problem related to inverses. So the previous talk actually had some of the previous things here, solution to the previous ones. And in this talk, I'm going to concentrate on this one exercise, which is this. A monoid where every element has a left inverse is a group. Now, what's the definition of a group? in terms of monoid. So monoid already means you have a binary operation, it's associative and has an identity element. What's the definition of group in terms of monoid? Uh, inverse, plus inverse. So it's a monoid where every element has a two-sided inverse. Okay, so a group, so what we know is, we know that a group is a monoid in which every element has a two-sided inverse. Okay. Now, can you say a little more? Yes, we can say a little more. We know that in a monoid, if an element has a left inverse and a right inverse, then what? Yeah, they're the same. They're the same. They are by associativity. So in fact, if every element has a left inverse and every element has a right inverse, then we know that they are equal. Mm -hmm. Again, we use associativity in that group. That's why it works only if you are in a monad, not in arbitrary magma. Okay? So if every element has a left inverse and every element has a right inverse, then we know that the left and right inverse are equal, so it's a two-sided inverse, and we get a group. Okay. So we don't have to postulate the left and right inverse to be equal, that follows. But what we are asked to prove is slightly stronger than that. So we just have a monoid where every element has a left inverse. So how would you show, just from the fact that every element has a left inverse, that you actually have a group? So just an element having a left inverse doesn't imply the element has a right inverse. Okay? So that's the problem. So how do you get around that? Do you see the problem? What's the problem? Well, you want to say that the existence of left inverse implies the existence of right inverse. Yeah. Now that's not true for and just any element in a monoid has a left inverse doesn't actually imply it has a right inverse. Okay? So we have to do something more subtle. We cannot just say A has a left inverse so A also has a right inverse. That's not what we can do because you do have elements in monoids which have left inverses but not right inverses. You can construct examples. So so what's really going on? Maybe I'll take an example of a element for monoid and an element which has a left inverse, but not a right inverse. So, so let me just check. So let's say let's take a set S is one comma two, and M is the set of all functions from S to S. set of all functions from S to S. How many such functions are there? Uh, four. How do you get four? Oh, not four. Six. No, it's four. Oh. <laughs> it's two squared. So in general, so the first element, so one you can send to either one or two, and two you can send to either one or two. Okay, so M has size four. Oh. I, I, I changed it to 6 because I think maybe we have 3. We can send every... Oh, actually... No, S to S. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Four. Now, is M a monoid under composition? Yes, it is. So, so define the multiplication on M just as function composition. Okay, so you can compose two functions. From S to S, you'll still get a function from S to S. And what's the identity element of this monoid? Identity function. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, let me get an example with one, two. Okay. Well, no, actually, you cannot get an example with S is one, two. However, we didn't actually use anything about one, two. So, so you can definitely construct this one, but to get an example which I was interested in, you'd have to change yourself. Okay, so take S as just, let's say, all the integers. Okay? You can still construct the set of all functions from S to S. Now it's a lot bigger, right? You can still compose such functions. And under composition, the identity map is still the identity. Okay? Right? Now I want to construct, I want to consider some functions which when you compose one way, you get the identity, but when you compose the other way, you don't. So let's say you take an element uh, x and send it to 2x. So consider the function x goes to 2x. Okay. Uh, so this is a function from z to z. Okay, so f is an m. Right? Now, can I find a function g such that g composed f is the identity? On z. So, what do I need to do? Well, g x is defined as what? Half x. For even x. Well, this 2z just is shorthand for saying even x. Uh, what about odd x? Well, actually you can do anything with odd x. It doesn't matter. Right? You cannot use x over 2 because that doesn't make sense. Is this all here? Yeah. But you can send g uh, x to anything else. Maybe you just send x to x. It doesn't matter what you do to odd x, right? Now, it's true that g composed f is the identity, right? You can start with anything, double it, and then when you double it, you're in the even integers, and then you divide it by 2. Okay, so f has a left inverse, right? Does f has a have a right inverse? So f has a left inverse. Does it have a right inverse? So can I find a function h such that f composed h is the identity? Hmm? Yeah. How? Oh. This function? This also well, if you start with an even thing, it's true you'll get back where you started. Right? You first do divided by 2, then you multiply it by 2. Mm -hmm. But what happens if you started with an odd thing? Could you get back to the odd thing? No. No? Right? And in fact, not just this, any, any definition you choose, any function h you choose, you first do h, start with an odd thing, you first do h on that, then you do f on that. You can never come back to the odd thing you started with, right? Because f always sends stuff to even stuff. Right? Mm -hmm. So the answer is no. And the reason is, sir, because f is not surjective. Because f is not surjective. That is, you know what surjective means? Yes. Okay, so f doesn't have range equal to all of z. So it's not surjective. You can never find a h such that f composed h is identity. 
right? Because if f composed h is identity, that would mean that f composed h is surjective, which would force f to be surjective, right? So the reason why it's not right invertible is that it's not surjective. And the reason is why was what is the reason that it was left invertible? Hmm? Because what what sort of an obvious necessary condition for something to be left invertible? It has to be injective, right? Mm -hmm. So. If f were sending two different things to the same thing, there would be no hope of composing and then separating them again. Mm -hmm. So the things which are injective are, at least it seems like maybe they can be inverted on the left, and the things which are surjective, it seems maybe they can be inverted on the right. Uh, now it turns out that actually any injective thing you can always invert on the left, any surjective thing can always invert on the right. But this particular function is injective but not surjective, that's why it's left invertible but not right invertible. Now, I was originally trying to do something with a set of size 2, but the reason it doesn't work with a set of size 2 or any finite set, this type of construction, I mean, this construction with all functions on a finite set, doesn't work, is that on a finite set, functions of a finite set to itself are injective if and only if they're subjective, right? For a finite set, function being injective just means that, like it sends everything somewhere different, but by counting arguments, you can see that if it's injective, it's subjective, right? In a set to itself. That's why you couldn't construct this counterexample with the uh, functions on a finite set to itself. Okay, so we have now an example, we've seen an example, and the details don't really matter much, but we've seen an example where you have elements which have left inverses, but don't have right inverses, okay? Hmm? So, so the naive hope was that maybe we can prove that if an element has a left inverse, it also has a right inverse, and therefore they are equal, and then you get a group. But that's not does that doesn't work. it doesn't work at least so simply as that, right? Okay, so how do you get around that problem? Hmm. I'm sure. Well, you can do better than that. So, so what do we need to use? Well, let's go back to our example. So you started with this function f, right? f was f was an example of a function which has a what, but not a what? Mm -hmm. But not a right and right. Okay, so f is a function which has a left inverse, but not a right inverse. And therefore, we have this kind of trouble. However, this says a monoid where every element has a left inverse. The key word here is every element. So how do you use the fact that not just a particular element, but every element has a left inverse? What's the key thing you can use? Okay, let's go back here. So f has a left inverse g, right? Hmm? Mm. Does g have a left inverse? Okay, so in this case, what's happening? G composed f is the identity. Whenever you have a composite of two things being the identity, what can you say? The the thing on the right, which is the one you apply first, has to be injective or surjective. Injective. injective and the thing on the left, the one you apply later, has to be surjective because it has to cover everything, right? Mm -hmm. So the inverse of f is g. G is surjective but not injective, right? Mm -hmm. So does g have a left inverse? No. Maybe. Well, if, if for G to have a left inverse, G would also have to be injective, right? Mm -hmm. Is uh, G injective? I don't know. Yes. Well, this this one. Well, oh, you yeah, should look yeah, at it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is it injective? Can does it send different things to different things? Yes. 
No, does does if if x one and x two are different, can g x one be equal to g x two? That's my question. You think no? You think it has to be injected? Why? How did you reason that? Well, it is injected. Why? Except for zero. That's what is what I said. No, zero is fine. Right? G of zero is zero. Oh, right. So when you have a function defined piecewise, it could be non-injective for two reasons. One is that within each piece you have collisions, but there's another way it could fail to be injective. What's the other way? You have a function with piecewise definition. Mm -hmm. How could it fail to be injective? It could fail to be injective because either of the pieces is not injective. But it could also fail to be injective because the two pieces the two pieces collide, mm -hmm. right? But they don't collide in this case. Well, they do. Like g of two is one, right? G of one is also one, right? Okay. So they do collide, and that's this particular g. But in general, whatever g you write down. It's an inverse for f. It it's a, it's a surjective, but it cannot be injected. And the reason is roughly that g is already. It has to be this on the even integers, right? It has to send even every even integer to its half, right? But that already covers all the integers, right? Just the image of the even integers alone covers all the integers, right? So wherever you send an odd integer, it has to collide with one of the images of even integers. Right, okay. so that's why G is is uh, not injected, which means that G cannot be inverted. So what I'm trying to say is that in our counter example, it's not true that every element has a left inverse. What happens is that some elements have left inverses, but the left inverses you find for those elements don't have left inverses. Right. So. So, so now can you tell me how do you use the fact that every element has a left inverse? Hmm? Well, if every element has a left inverse, it means every element is injective. Well, injective is when you think of them as functions like that, but they need not actually be functions. So you have to think about it uh, more generally. Well, let's just do, do it like this. So let's start with an element in your in our set. Okay, so let's, let's just go back go to general. So M is your monoid. Okay, and it has an identity element E and uh, identity E, and the operation is star. Okay, so pick an element A and M. So let's say B is a left inverse for A. Now what do you do? This is a trick. You want to use that every element has a left inverse. So what do we do? We found a left inverse for A, but now you want to use that every element has a left inverse. So you try to find a left inverse for something else. What do we do? What do you mean? Well, so the idea is, we, it's not just enough to say A has a left inverse, therefore A has a right inverse, right? Because that's not true. But what we want to use is, we want to use the fact that everything has a left inverse. So we want to take a new element and say, now that element also has a left inverse. So what's the next element which has a left inverse? B. B has a left inverse. So let's say C is a left inverse for B. Okay, now what? Well, think about B. What's A in terms of B? So B is a left inverse for A, right? That means that B star A is E. And this means that C star B is E. 
So B being a left inverse for A means A is a what for B? Hmm? So A is a right inverse for B. Okay, now you can tell me what to do next. Right, so B star A is B. So think about the element B. What do you have? B has both left and right inverse. Yeah. So therefore, because we are in a monoid, so because we are associated, what do we know? It's a group. Not a we aren't yet there. Mm -hmm. So B has both left and right inverses. So what do we know? The left and right inverse are equal. Right? So what do we get? And is a two sided inverse for B. Okay, good. So now are we done? So A is a two-sided inverse for B, but what we really wanted to do was we wanted to find a two-sided inverse for A, right? Mm -hmm. But we know that that if A is a two-sided inverse for B, B is a two-sided inverse for A. So now we sort of do that thing, that inverse. So B is a two-sided inverse for A. And so what we've shown is that starting with any arbitrary element in the monoid, we can find a two-sided inverse for that element. Okay? So what, what was the real trick we, we did? What, what was the trick? Every element. Yeah, and where did we use that? What we did was after we took the left inverse, we took the left inverse of the left inverse again. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's, that's what our trick was. Because, uh, because then we could get an element which has both a left and a right inverse, then we said the inverse are equal, and then we flipped around and said A is a two-sided inverse for B, so B is a two-sided inverse for A. So what does this tell you overall? It tells you that that for the definition of group, you could actually, when you are checking that that something is a group, you just have to check that that every element has a left inverse. You don't have to separately check that every element has a right inverse, and you don't have to check that the inverse are equal. You can just check the left inverse condition because the rest follows automatically. Okay.